Hey guys, it's Morgan Mitchell and I'm on the Unlaced podcast with Jake. Morgan Mitchell, welcome to the Unlaced podcast. Thank you for, for jumping on. Anytime. How are we going? Yeah, very well. How, how are you? Where are you based at the minute? Um, I'm currently in Colorado Springs, but heading to LA this weekend for a little bit more excitement and sunshine. <laughs> yeah, the boys boring in Colorado. Out of Melbourne. Yeah, uh, it's not too bad, but you know, I mean, if you have to pick between this and LA. Yeah, fair, fair call. <laughs> So how how long have you? Because you were you were stuck in um uh, you were stuck here like me, and then you you got yourself out for uh, for training and yeah. and just a better way of life, I assume. Yeah, I had to. It's actually part of my contract that I had to get a few races in um, with Adidas. So I thought, you know what, with the way things are going, I probably should try and get overseas and run. And I think it was like one week into stage four, I was already losing my mind. <laughs> I feel kind of bad, but I just had to get out of here, get out of there. Sorry. So. No, I don't blame you. I don't blame. You. We're still in the same position as when you left, which is kind of s- kind of crazy. But I mean, how insane is it? Uh, like, it's a little. We're at what are we at now? Crazy. Like five to ten cases per day. So. You know. I mean, come on. Yeah. Right. Stage three should be fine. That's right. That's right. Um, no, but anyway, as I said, thank you, thank you for jumping on. You are. Uh, a superstar in Australian sport, as we all know, and and one thing I do love about you is your personality. For people that have seen you get interviewed or in any form of uh, media, you're just completely yourself all the time. Uh, you don't have a second gear of personality or a fake persona, um, which I think is just awesome and infectious. Um, but I guess I've only really known you a small amount of time, and in that period of knowing you, you strike me as someone that's a very competitive person. Um, <laughs> so where where did you get this competitive nature from? Kind of funny, actually. I would have to say from my two sisters. Like, they don't even watch... They don't watch podcasts. Anything to do with me, they don't watch. So it's kind of good so I can say this. <laughs> but we're all a year apart. And you can imagine three young girls in a room together. And we've all got the same interests. We all do the same thing. And I think that's where it started was with those two. Because I'm the middle child, golden child. So <laughs> I had to make sure I was on top at all times, but um, they were both pretty sporty. And I think we we're, we're, were like three tomboys, you know, so it was more so not fighting for a hairbrush, but it was kind of like wrestling matches, boxing matches, you know, all that stuff. So I'd have to say thanks, shout out to Liv and Brit for kind of putting that competitive edge up on the table for me. <laughs> what What's the age gap between Liv and Brit for... Um, Roughly a year, just a little bit over. So I'm 26 on Saturday, but so Brittany will be turning 25. I'm turning 26, and Liv's just turned 27 in May. Oh wow! So I know, it's pretty crazy. So you're all like so close to each other then, from an age bracket yeah. point of view. Okay. So but th- I tell you what's funny. Like, there's actually nine in my family. Like I have. Yeah. What? Yeah. I know. <laughs> so there's seven other like half brothers and sisters. Oh, yeah. that's but crazy. That no one really knows about me. <laughs> that's crazy. What are they spread out everywhere? Are they all in Australia or? No, so my the oldest Ariane is in Texas, okay. and then it goes my stepbrother Samuel, then us three, then Jerry, Celeste, and Athena, and then there's oh sorry, um, one more that I don't really know her that well. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Yasmin is her name. <laughs> well, shout out Yasmin. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully she's listening. I guess we're being open and honest. Yeah, why not? Yeah, yeah, we're being open and honest. That's yeah. cool. So, because your 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 dad's um, African American and your your mum's Australian, right? Yeah. 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 So there, that's why there's a, probably a spread out global <laughs> family. No, but uh, the the reason why I wanted to speak about your competitive nature and it, it's fu- it's from a funny story in my opinion, um, because I've sat at a what I would call a relatively competitive Uno game with you. Um, and for some reason you, you won quite a few consecutive games, which is one thing, you know, it can be a bit of a luck game, but as the games went on, the cards started to feel warmer in my hands. And there was a lot of, a lot of them were draw fours and reverses and skips. And I'm thinking, what the fuck? Anyway, next thing you know, the end of the Uno game and you're sitting on a pile of cards 
<laughs> and had no remorse or no sympathy whatsoever. And I'm like, she's just, she just wants to win. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Well, from what I remember, the rules were, if you can get away with cheating, great. Yeah. Oh, okay, sick. I'm just gonna I'm gonna sit on my cards and win. Yeah. And then I think I sat on like three at one time. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, bang, 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 Uno, I win. And I thought, you know what, no one's catching on to it, this works. So I kept doing it. And that was the thing, like everyone else was kind of cheating here and there. But I don't think anyone caught on to it. If you just put them in your pocket or sit on them, you're gonna win in like two minutes. Yeah, um, I don't know why I didn't catch on to it. Time, I felt pretty good about it, to be honest. Like, I didn't care. I know. The rules. That, that the rules was were written for a reason. That was the worst part about it for me. I'm like, she had no remorse. She was she was content <laughs> with that approach. <laughs> no, I that, feel like if you won, you'd be the exact same. 100%. 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was doing the same thing. It's just I got caught. <laughs> um, no, because when, when, and this ties into a little bit with your training, and I know you train with, obviously, the female runners, but you also train with male runners, and... Uh, yeah. something you've said is every time you step on the track, your mentality is just to win. Um, so I just wanted to try get a bit more depth to what that comment actually means to you when with your training and, and racing. Yeah, I think it's just like, that's kind of the end goal. You know what I mean? It's not like I win every race, that'd be nice, obviously. But I think training with boys, it kind of toughened me up a little bit. Like I've always been a bit of a tomboy as well. So I kind of, I fit in that environment a lot better. And it's, they've just taught me, you know, I've had sessions where I would be beating the boys and then they've got sessions or certain, you know, training sessions where they beat me. And that's where it kind of just grew from, I think, is like, all right, if I can beat a boy, I can beat anyone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think it just kind of comes naturally as well. You know what it's like being in that world of sport is like, obviously you want to kick your goals and you want to run the fastest time that you possibly can. But at the end of the day, we're all there for medals. Really. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think it's just one of those things that's always been drilled into me. But definitely my first serious training group with Peter Fitzgerald back in, to, from 2015 to 2017, it was me and like eight guys. And, you know, I, I loved it because you could just talk shit. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the boys don't really care. Yeah. I could be a little bit rough as well. And, yeah. you know, I'd come to training in a mood and they'd just be like, Oh, Morgan's here and she's unhappy just like stay away yeah. I think that's what I liked is like they just let me be emotional and like kind of be free with how I express myself that's so that's awesome yeah definitely I'd say a shout out Rory because I know he might actually watch this at one stage I'm pretty sure I like he made me so angry one time I can't remember he's probably just butt fucking around and I was like jumper punching I'm like we're gonna fucking do this rap. <laughs> um, but it's only you know only have like an hour an hour every day out of the week uh, you know, five days a week to actually do that, to actually be that personality. So it's like, get the anger out now because the boys can cough it. Yeah. <laughs> and move on. I'm sure they'd take it. I'm sure they'd take it and be supportive. Give it a hothead. Yeah. <laughs> Look, did, did you play much um, team sports when you were growing up? Were you predominantly playing team sports? Have you always been in a sort of an athletics environment? A bit of both, really, like... I went to a primary school in South Melbourne called Galilee and my mum worked long hours and they had such an awesome after school program. I'm not sure if they still have it, but you could do anything. Like, honestly, I did chess, piano lessons. There's a thing called circus skills and like they had a what? piece in the gym. I know, I know. It was like gymnastics, but with, it was a little bit more fun. I don't know. <laughs> it was there, fun and flimsy. And, yeah. That was cool. But again, I think mum... Being a single mum and trying to take care of three kids, she was like, far out. The mm. only thing I can do is get them to play sport because at least I don't really have to focus on what they're doing and they've got a team environment. So for me, it was probably, and my main three were basketball, swim, uh, netball and track. Um, and then it, I did make a few teams for netball and kind of just thought, you know, I'm a little bit over it. I just wanted to beat Liv and make as many teams as she did. And kind of did that and <laughs> I thought, okay, I missed track after four years let's try and go to the Olympics. And that was me getting drunk every weekend in year 11. <laughs> I came up with that idea. How good's that? <laughs> isn't that funny? Oh, honestly, isn't that sad? That's, that's, kind of funny. that's where it all started. So did, did you, because yeah. I'm, I'm fascinated, right? And I don't even, if, even if you know that I used to play soccer, which is probably cool. I would probably prefer that. But yeah. All, yeah, all I've ever known is team sports. So, uh, and like, in team sports, as you know, you've been, you've experienced it. You just vibe off yeah. other people. And when you play bad, people pick you up. And when you play good, everyone's like, oh, you know, it's infectious. But for you, it's just, yeah. you're kind of versing yourself all the time. 
So can for me just uh, what is that like and and how do you motivate yourself and when you when you have bad days what's that you know what's that process like for you Um it's interesting I think when I think about it I th- I'm probably more of an individual sport person because even when if we lost a game in anything in a team environment I'd be kicking myself for ages mm. But I think it kind of comes from like, you know, we get out onto the track and you're on the world stage and it's just you, whether you run good or bad. You kind of have a team around you if you run bad and then you also have that team there when you run well. But it's also nice, like for me, it's more so just going back to your hotel. It's quite, I don't know if it's like egotistical, but you go back to your hotel room and say, you know, you've just made the Olympic team, you've won, a, you've won the nationals and you've run a PB. It's honestly the best feeling knowing you've done that all on your own. <laughs> yeah, that would be cool. <laughs> you know, it's hard to explain. It's just like, fuck, like all on me. Obviously, the team built that. But I, at the end of the day, I'm the one getting out there on the track and just doing it by myself. And the only difference is, I guess, your team is like your best friends, your coach, you know, your physio. And you just kind of have to hope that if you do run well, that they are keen to have a drink with you after. Because I know, <laughs> like, you know, you'd have a team of boys and be like a cool boys club where you can just you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. each other. But it's not like I can necessarily call up. I'm pretty sure my coach would be keen, but she's like 50-year-old woman. Yeah, it's a bit different, right? <laughs> she does love to. Yeah, yeah. yeah, she, yeah. She, yeah. So she's probably going to turn back the shots. She's um, a different. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if I won the Olympics... Yeah, that's I'd a different be. story. She'd probably be making you have shots, yeah. No, but th- there would be something liberating about, I guess, the independence of being successful in a career in any form. Um, yeah. But I guess when, when you are having those bad days or you've got to get up, get yourself up to go to training and really it's just you and your coach yeah. or some of your teammates, is that... Do you have challenging periods with that or, or are you kind of so accustomed to it now? No, I, oh, I will always have challenging periods I think because I have so much going on away from the track as well I find it a huge thing to be like okay I still have to focus on track it's you know my main source of income this that the other but the one thing for me is like if I can't be bothered I know by the next session or the next race if I run crap it is because I couldn't be bothered and there's nothing more embarrassing than having a bad session or race so for me that's just motivating in itself you know it's like if I don't do this I'm gonna suck like let's just get up and go (laughs) but it's also the things that come with it like a lot of athletes say yeah I just want to see how fast I can run how far I can you know throw or jump or whatever but for me it's like man if you know if I don't go to training then I'm giving up a huge opportunity yes to run fast but it's also you know to connect with other athletes to meet potential sponsors to travel the world like I can't yeah. Why would I want to give that up for an extra five minutes in bed? Yeah. Which I have done sometimes, don't get me wrong, but <laughs> as I've gotten older, I've learned not to do that. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's a lot of collateral with that. Actually, one of the yeah. one of the things I, I know about you with your training is you really thrive off uh, training early in the morning and like getting yourself up and yeah. going, why? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. I'm a morning person for sure. Okay. Like honestly, even a night out, I could get home at... 3 30 4 30 a.m and my body clock will wake me up at 6 30 no matter what wow it's so weird i could wake up have a coffee then i might go back to sleep but anyway moving on i think i've always been a firm believer in if you wake up early you've got more life to live mm. you know i've got more time to spend and i kind of just love getting training out of the way you know what i mean like i don't really like hanging around waiting for it when i could have been doing other things and my coach is a morning person too and so are a few of, a few of my training partners so i just thought Let's just get after it at seven. We'll be done by eight thirty nine, and then you know everyone else is waking up, and we can just go out to coffee, shop, hang with friends, answer emails. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but for me, it's definitely like just get up and live. You know what I mean? Yeah. I I actually think I I don't know what it is. It's something about getting up early in training or training in like harsh weather, like rain or or yeah. cold. I think there's something like there's a mental toughness that comes with that. Yeah can't define what it is but something liberating sure. and powerful yeah but isn't that interesting as an athlete it's like do we just get used to it you know what i mean maybe like I, i'm kind of i think i'm just used to it now like the weather conditions and stuff especially in winter yeah, true you know, first few weeks i'm like what the fuck but then after it i'm like uh you know yeah. whatever <laughs> true, true. And gloves, she'll be right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah training in melbourne i can imagine you're probably used to all all kinds of weather um uh, well, you, you know, this year was my first 
stint at home in eight years for winter. This is my first winter. Yeah, you and said you don't like winter here, do you? Nah. And I'm not, I've never really been to the snow properly. I think I've spent one day there. But it's like, if you're going to be cold, at least give me something to do, you know? <laughs> Let me yeah. snowboard or far. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. won't be doing that again. You're like me. We're coloured. We're made for the heat. We're, we're made for the sunny climate. Because <laughs> <laughs> you, you got into athletics, I think it was around two in the well, 2000 uh, roughly when we had the yeah. sydney olympics um which is a pretty crazy time i think everyone was drawn to the sport around around then and one of the most famous moments at that uh meet was kathy freeman's run and where she won gold and it's kind of edged in australian history i was just curious to know if that performance or the olympics in itself was something that really i guess inspired you to be you know an, ath- an athletic uh, runner at an olympic games It definitely did for sure. It's quite funny because, you know, people do ask this question, I reckon to any athlete, and if you weren't an athlete at the time or, you know, an aspiring athlete, it'd be crazy for you not to get inspired by that run. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, so for me, it was quite, it was kind of cool because it was like, wow, a black woman running and she won and, you know, it's the Olympics in Australia. And I guess it did start the kind of fire in the belly, but... At the same time, all I really do remember from the Olympics is colouring in the mascots at school, <laughs> thinking this is so cool. You know what I mean? <laughs> that part was probably, I wish I could tell more people that, is that that was my favourite. I don't even, was it Ollie? What yeah, yeah, Ollie? it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. I remember. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I reckon they were the coolest mascots and that's all I really cared about as a kid. Yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Cause what, how old would you have been then? Like, what, five or six around that time? So, um, pretty young. Uh, Five when it happened and six obviously the month. Yeah, we'll say six that year. So you've been pretty much doing athletics for as long as you can remember. Um, yeah, I mean, I did have a pretty big break from, what, maybe 15, 6, no, 14, yep. I think. Like, I'd still do school athletics just to get out of school, but I just didn't care for it until the, I heard Rio. You know yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, anyone hears Rio, you're like... <laughs> <laughs> well, spe- speaking of Rio, because that was your Olympic debut... Um, yeah. and must have been just an incredible moment and something for so long you were preparing for. Um, yeah. and, and I actually watched your 400 meter heat the, uh, recently uh, just to kind of, I guess, retract that event. Cause I do remember watching it at the Olympics and, and as part of the, the build up to it, the commentator mentions, you know, the amazing Australian season you had being the 400 meter Australian champion and you know, just athleticism overall. But she said, apparently she's incredibly nervous, <laughs> Um, as you were sort of preparing on the blocks. So, I mean, can you explain just, you know, training for an event for so long okay. and then it, it being there just must be crazy. Yeah. Can I just say, this is one thing I've never been, been able to clear up, is I was, I was nervous, but I wasn't fucking that, that nervous. Like, my <laughs> face always just looks unhappy and sad on the start. Like, that's just my relaxed face. It's kind of ugly. Okay, cool. But I wasn't, I think it's just, what people get they're like oh and she's so nervous like, who's telling you that i don't i don't see why <laughs> i go to my coach i'm so nervous right yeah but i don't see why <laughs> channel seven pe- people and commentators when they say that kind of frustrates me because it's like well if she's not nervous she doesn't she doesn't care i mean usually when there's nerves it's a good thing um yeah yeah but but like i mean you you obviously settled those nerves because in in the heat you ran an incredible race you came second and, and qualified yeah. for the next phase which you must have been so proud of yeah, I mean, like, that's the thing. I was Obviously, I was nervous, just I wasn't having a breakdown. But it was kind of cool because I knew exactly what I had to do um, to make the semis. And it, the thing, I, the only thing I was really pissed off about was that I was 0.05 off of my PB. So that, for me, I was just like, far out. If you're actually going to go hard to make the semis, <laughs> run a PB. Yeah. But it was, honestly, it was just like box ticked. Like, I'm an Olympian now, you know, across the line, yeah. done the job. Obviously, it didn't go well in the semis because that's when I just kind of went out too hard and blew up and it happens. But it was such a cool learning experience because then I got another opportunity to back up with the girls in the relay and I think we did such an incredible job with that. Um, but yeah, all in all, it's like, for me, it was just like far out. You know, four years ago, I'm going, you know, going out more than I'm going to school, you know, uh, and then four years later, <laughs> I'm at the Olympics. How does this it's, it's insane. <laughs> It's a pinch yourself moment. The coolest part. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That to me was the like the coolest part. It's just like 
if I can do it, honestly, anyone can. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's awesome. Because one of the um, and I know you've you've recently changed your, your event, but just kind of wanted to get your perspective. Like, what's your strategy when you're running a four hundred? Because yeah, uh, uh, how do you how do you I guess because it's a big run, it's a big sprint. Yeah. I mean, it's different for everyone. Like, I probably, I'm definitely not the fastest. I've got more endurance in me. So I would go out quite relaxed and then just rely on my strength to come home hard when everyone else is dying. So that was pretty cool. It's just like, you know, get out hard, a good relaxed rhythm, which we call a float down the back, um, work the bend. This is if it's all going well. Work the bend and then, <laughs> you know, come, come home hard. And my coach was really good. Both of my first coach, Berkey, who is now my men mentor and the one that took me to the Olympics, Fitzy, they both just said, trust me, in the last 20 metres, you'd be surprised with how many people you catch. And I think it's like, even the last 50 in that heat run at the Olympics, you kind of see that. Yeah. It's like, just don't give up until you cross that line because that's when everyone, you know, the piano on the back. You know, 100%. <laughs> running backwards. So that's how we approached it for sure. You um, seem to, you seem, always, yeah. you seem to get an extra gear in that last hundred, don't you? I've watched a few of yeah, your races. It's just the chase. I just love the chase. You know what I mean? And I think it was from training with the boys. It's yeah. just like, fuck. It's, not, it's like that really cool feeling of like, you can see them dying and you're getting closer and closer and closer. And for me, I'd be like, fuck. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> <Whole ass. laughs> um, yeah, so how, that's kind of how I'd run it. How much is that, um, that sort of back 100 or 50 when I guess the runners are sort of giving their, their all, but how much of that is physical to mental? Because I assume the mental side comes in a lot um, as you're sort of yeah. pushing the body to the limit there. Definitely. I think I've always been a firm believer in, especially on that level playing field, is like, you know, we're all Olympians. We've all qualified. So technically, physically, we're kind of all the same. It, and it just depends on what people have done mentally to actually work through and break through that pain barrier. And that's what I try to, like, even a lot of my um, training partners that I train with that are younger, I'm just like, shit you get to states you're all obviously meant to be there it just depends on who wants it more really yeah um so i do try to work on that mental state a lot because there's nothing quite like lactic acid oh. you know what i mean i don't know oh. you know what lactic acid it's, feels like right i don't uh, think i've felt it to the levels you would in in at the highest sort oh. of speed but yeah there are some <laughs> key sessions i can still remember to this day that have just felt like one time just before rio i thought i wasn't going because i pretty much passed out after a session <laughs> you know and it's funny because it was actually a session that kathy had done back in 2000 and we saw the times and me and my friend were being kind of cocky like oh let's just try and get as close as we can went out too hard for the first four reps and i'm not even joking I, my coach and my training partner can tell you this we're in queensland on a training camp we finished the last rep i'm crawling to try and get water and I thought I was already in base camp in Miami. Oh my like, God. I to pack the bags. We're going to Rio next week. He's like, Morgan, we're in Queensland. I swear to God, I thought I was somewhere else. And that's how bad it was. That's just yeah, a, like... I was swearing at him. Like, I felt so bad. Because I was like, get my water bottle, you... <laughs> and then I'd be like, you know, like, spazzing out on the grass. So what's that just but a point know, of exhaustion? Just, yeah. But it's like what you have to do. You know what I mean? Of course. It's sad, but we keep showing up. Yeah. No, <laughs> I'm... Weird. <laughs> yeah why <laughs> so when when you're running i guess do you i can imagine it's probably you have these nerves building up to the race but as soon as you're off the blocks like you must just be so present in your performance are you able to clearly think as you run or like what like what goes in in your brain whilst you're running is it just like huff and puff or <laughs> that's what i would do it's different that's the crazy thing is like when I've had my best races, I don't remember them because it's like everything just falls into place. But when I'm a little bit more stressed or like not focused on what I'm meant to be doing, you, you know, sometimes you can hear the crowd or I notice other girls like on my left or right. And that's when I'm just like, fuck, what are you doing, you idiot? Just focus. <laughs> but it's not until like the last hundred, your brain is so full of lactic. It's like you just zone out. You know what I mean? Really? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even. I don't know if it's like that for other athletes. That <laughs> should be you. Just, like, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> just be like, get the fuck to the line. Yeah, like, go. I get to the line, the quicker I can get my massage and eat a burger. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Do you just yeah. smash food after races or like? After a race, ah, uh, so I quickly debrief with the coach, cool down, always get a massage, and then I'm such a fries person. 
So if I'm not like, you know, you know it's, what it's like after sport. You sometimes you're just not that hungry. Yeah. But true. my usual go-to is just fries. Fries. Sometimes a burger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty simple. Yeah. That's good. You get salt in the body, just right? Sleep. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, that was the one thing. They're like, as long as you get salt, I'm like sick. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> handy. Like, athletics to me um, is pretty unique in the sense, especially at the top level where you are, in the sense that you train every day so hard, and even when you're not training. You're probably training either mentally or you're doing like some form of recovery for to be able to train. Um, yeah. And majority of the fans that are going to tune into the Commonwealth Games or your World Champs or even the Olympic Games, like they don't really maybe appreciate the sacrifice and dedication you're giving to an event they're all going to tune in that goes by in like two minutes. Like that's pretty crazy to me, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know we're kind of crazy athletes like that's one thing I wish is if I one thing I would love to do especially if I no I'll still be running after Tokyo who, who am I kidding <laughs> but I think for the next Olympics after Tokyo once I am more of a seasoned 800 runner um, um, yeah so one thing I've wanted to do just for the fans and like people just looking in is to show them what a year looks like you know what I mean awesome um, because you know if you have a good race or a bad race, you're still going to have people that will judge you and try and say a lot of BS and it's just like far out. <laughs> I don't think anyone really, really knows where I've started and how hard I've had to work just to get here. Um, but that's the thing. It's kind of weird because for us, it's all worth it. Any athlete will tell you, like, we train day in and day out. I try to, like, limit, obviously, the partying and the bad eating to, you know, the partying probably only three times a year, which sucks. Yeah, yeah. A lot of my friends don't even... <laughs> <laughs> sorry um but that's the thing is like the sacrifices you have to make are all worth it but you know sometimes looking back it's like oh, you're missing out on so much oh, and just for people to judge you as well it kind of sucks on top of that but at the end of the day it's like I can still you know I can still call myself an olympian i've been to some amazing countries so you know at the in the end it's all worth it but you, stay tuned for the documentary i was <laughs> gonna say so are you documenting like something now for leading up to tokyo is that what's happening um, I am doing a small thing with a business called Signet. Um, it's a bit of a surprise because obviously things need to fall into place. Like if you can make a documentary, but you still need to run well, yeah, make course. the team run well on the team. But one thing I'd like to do is a longer one where it's just an extended version of, you know, this is what it's take. This is, this is what it took. This is where I've been. This is where I've come from. Just to give people more of an insight, like the older I've gotten, the more I've realized I can choose what I want to share, but I think I'm finally ready to share like the deep dark secrets as well that come along with it just to show people like you know what it's like athletes are humans but you can't some people just don't want to believe it you know what i mean yeah yeah that's that's <laughs> so, that's the whole purpose for me of this podcast is humanizing athletes because people yeah. will always relate to you as morgan mitchell the runner but morgan mitchell's a human off the track and there's so much you're yeah. giving up that the average human mm -hmm. does for enjoyments and pleasures you know, to, to yeah. run your best race in Tokyo. So I think that would be so cool if you could, if you document yeah. that, uh, people can have an insight into how hard you actually work. But that's the funniest part is like, I want it to be like, so like M-A-R rated though. It's like, you see literally everything, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> me crying, this is what I've been through, me partying, like it's just everything. Yeah, yeah. Just to let people know, like at the end of my career, when it all doesn't matter, I like, can't get in trouble for anything anymore. It's just like, this is me, <laughs> 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 oh, I'd love to see it. I'd love to see it. I'd be pumped. I think that'd be awesome. Um, I, yeah. hope, I hope that gets gets off the ground. You mentioned there as yeah, well cool. um, as you're preparing for for Tokyo the 800 meters. Which for those that know Morgan Mitchell at the Rio Olympics and even the Com Games, she was Morgan Mitchell, the 400 meter runner. Um, mm -hmm. So the change to 800. I mean, it's not just an extra 400 meters. It's a big big difference. Yeah. Um, so what what led to that change and and how are you feeling about the event? Um, overall yeah so it was after com games well during com games my best friend was coaching me i lost a coach my coach sorry we parted ways physio everything and i was kind of lost and my best mate who was also my training partner was like okay i guess i'm gonna take the reins and i was such a mess leading into that com games it was pretty sad but at the end of it i thought i'm either gonna quit or I'm going to try something different. And I knew I didn't want to quit. So I was like, hmm, Luke Matthews just, you know, got the bronze medal in the 800. I've known him for a while. I know his mom. I was like, hey, Liz, as a joke, I'm like, would you coach me over the 800? She's like, yeah. 
and I seriously went to Europe for like maybe three months, went to Coachella as well, got hammered, just called off my season. I'm like, screw this, I'm just gonna have some fun. Yeah. And sure enough, in September that, September 2018, I started with Liz. Cause I just said to her, I'm like, I am so over the 400. I'm so over people thinking I'm gonna be the next Kathy Freeman. I'm so over people thinking I'm a 400 runner. I feel more of an eight, like I'm more of an 800 runner. I think I can do it. I just didn't like the pressure that came with the 400 and I just wasn't enjoying it. And it was kind of cute. She's like, okay, well, I guess we'll just aim for Tokyo because world champs are less, you know, no, an exact year away. If you make that, it'll be a miracle. And I was like, we're making it. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I remember telling her, I'm like, I'm going to Doha because I have a lot of people I want to prove wrong. And it was kind of cool because I've never met a more supportive family than the Matthews family. You know what I mean? They're That's the nice. most incredible people and they stood by me through everything. Like, I don't think people realize how much bullying was going on behind the scenes from certain people, from certain organizations even. And no with, matter what with happens, the change, with the change in event, like, okay, game plan. How do we help Morgan? You know, and I think honestly, they that that family got me to Doha and to two flat, and we had such a cool year together. So that's incredible. So when you say there was like, I love the eight now. Yeah. When there was backlash, um, are you referencing from changing the events? Like a lot of people were turning on you for for doing that. Yeah, like, I don't even have Facebook, but bless my friends, I was trying to do the right thing, but they'd send me certain comments from people saying, she's a wash-up, she's a nobody, she'll never make it. And then from, you know, so, I don't know, how do I say this without, it's not defamation if you don't say their name, but certain organisation mm -hmm. and the people high up in that said organisation were just like, you're never going to make it, don't know why you're bothering, you should just stick to the, at least making a 400 relay. You know, you're, you're too slow now, you're this, you're that. I was like, no one really cares about my happiness. They just care about, oh, shit, if Morgan's not running the 400, who are we going to market? If Morgan's not doing this, how are we going to do this? And it's like, does anyone actually care about what Morgan wants? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I have a lot of bad DMs, which I've kept on my phone for the right time, that people have said such mean things because it goes beyond your performance, you know. Then they start attacking your personal life. They start attacking your body. They start attacking so many different things that aren't even related to athletics. And again, that's why I love the Matthews family because Liz, I said to her, I haven't stood on a scale for so long and I haven't taken a body comp test for so long because I used to just get in there and cry because I was yeah. practically forced into doing it. And she was like, Morgan, I don't care how heavy you are, but if you rock up to my sessions and run my times, you'll get to where you want to get to. And I mean, like, you know, you start kind of taking care of yourself a little bit better because you know your coach trusts you and that's all I needed was a little bit of trust and understanding and... Yeah, I mean, we just did it. That's <laughs> it was crazy. nice making the team a little bit smaller and shutting out outside noise. But it's for me, I guess, like one thing I'd want to say is it's funny. People say, oh, but you've been in Vogue. You've done this. You've done that. You've got the life that everyone wants to live. It's like it doesn't mean anything. Like if I'm still I'm still allowed to be sad and yeah. have days where, you know, I don't want to do anything. And um, and that's, yeah, again, Liz is just such an amazing coach and she understands that. She's such a mum. I think that's what I love, you know? <laughs> so is that... <laughs> I think that's all I needed was like that motherly touch. <laughs> is that who the... Can you explain who the who the Matthews family are for the, I guess, the listeners tuning in who aren't aware of who oh, Liz yeah. is to you and, and the Matthews, or the extended Matthews family? Ah, Luke's going to love this. <laughs> yeah. Shout out, Luke. But, so Plug him. Luke Matthews, yeah. <laughs> I think the whole of Melbourne knows him. <laughs> Luke... Uh, is a track athlete as well, 8 and 15, and full athletics together. Um, and so, yeah, he won a bronze medal at the Com Games. Yep. Then Liz was his coach, who was his mum, and she's amazing. And then you've got Gav, who's the dad, and Gav's, you know, our pacemaker on the bike. And then you've got Michelle Matthews as well. And we go for a lot of jogs together, and she's like, she's one of my close mates now as well because of it. Um, and then you also have Ryan, the older brother, but he lives in London. So he's, I, I believe that he's there in spirit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of, they just work as like such a good group and they're such a good family to all the athletes in Liz's squad. Um, but yeah, I so that's up. kind of like them in a nutshell. But honestly, they, you know, they'll go to war for you. That's what I think I love. <laughs> cool. Shout out to the Matthews family though, because you need people in your corner like that. And so Morgan Mitchell should yeah. be able to change events if she wants and one for performance, but ultimately... It makes you happier running an 800 meter. I think athletes yeah. always perform their best when they're at the happiest. So, um, yeah, 
And it's pretty exciting for you. Has has the year? I mean, the the Olympics was supposed to be this year, wasn't it? So has has this extra sort of twelve yeah. months helped you transition into the eight hundred meters and maybe get even more out of yourself that you know the extra twelve months can give you? Um, I think it definitely has. It's it kind of sucks because I wish we had this extra year, extra year without COVID, obviously, so we could do more. But for me, it was great because we could actually try a few different things in training and kind of approaching training differently to try and open up faster, which we did. So we know what works and what doesn't now. Um, but also for me, it was kind of just nice to get a year to relax and not have to commit to so many different things because Olympic year for anyone is always just crazy. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, for, it was pretty easy, like pretty chill. Just, it was kind of sad at the same time because I do miss a lot of my friends, even overseas in Australia, whatever. And it was kind of nice seeing people compete day in, day out. Yeah. So to not have anything was just like weird. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully it goes ahead next year. Awesome. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Fingers crossed. It'd be great to to see just sport at the highest level back back to where it should be. Uh, I mean, what's your what's your feeling going into Tokyo? Have you set your go- set? Do you set goals now, or are you? I guess you just train every day, and when you get to the event, you're gonna give what you can, or if you know, should you make the team? Yeah. I mean. I definitely have goals. <laughs> yeah. The, the larger, the you know, the overall goal is obviously to go the, to the Olympics. Goals beyond that, I'm just kind of like, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Yeah. But for me right now, the small ones are to just make the team, to run consistently. You know, pro- I'd like to think I could run sub two for sure during the Australian season, which will be quite tough. But I know if I can do it there, then going overseas, I'll only get faster. Um, and it's kind of cool because there's a lot of depth in the 800 at the moment and my friend Katrina has the Australian record. So I'm hoping, hoping we can just play this like little tennis match with the record. Like you get it, I get it, you get it, awesome. I get it. My other friend Laura gets it. Like, you know, all these girls just keep kind of breaking that record and pushing each other, which is really cool. But yeah, right now it's just like do as much as you can, get as much of a base in as you can and then just take it day by day, right? Yeah, that's <laughs> you good. You just don't know what's going to happen next. True, yeah, because the event's not even set in stone, right? So it's like, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah who knows? So a, a lot of people know you for your athletic um, abilities and, and your performances, but more recently, your cameo in Game Changers, um, <laughs> which everyone's well, you know, well aware of now, uh, Morgan Mitchell, yeah. the vegan. Um, and I guess you speak about it for, you obviously doing it for health and agriculture um, choices, um, Actually, one of the things I love about that um, documentary is the guy, I think his name's Patrick, where he's just throwing kegs and like carrying yeah. different weights. And he says this funny comment. It's like um, someone goes in like, oh, how are you, you know, how are you as strong as an ox when you eat meat? And he goes, well, have you ever seen an ox eat meat? And right. It's pretty, pretty funny. But I'm keen to like, when did you transition into being a vegan? Is it something you've always been? Yeah, no. So I started... I think it was end of 2014 so pushing five years now and I honestly just haven't looked back like at the time I just didn't really care I'm like okay I'll try this vegan thing whatever and then the more I researched into it and what it does for the environment and stuff it, it was just like you know a no-brainer for me I just thought okay well I guess I'm just gonna have to drop everything and try and help the environment in any way I can and I won't lie it does have its challenges because I, like the vegan community is obviously amazing and they've been very supportive but at the same time sometimes it's like yes I'm still vegan like yes I have other things like I'm trying to focus on that trying to focus on the black community I'm also you know doing my part with Cottage by the Sea which helps disadvantaged children and I have a lot on my plate but being yeah the whole vegan thing and the game changer thing was just like a blessing you know what I mean it was just so cool it was such a cool thing to be a part of especially when it was when did it air so it was last year September October yeah and being able to go to the premiere in LA and like the whole Hollywood thing that was pretty sick. I went like, That's <laughs> awesome. That was just, you know, a little girl from Werribee. Who would have thought? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm actually not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a vegan, but after that documentary, I started ordering like vegan burritos and stuff. And I'm like, oh, this, like it, it had a real, it had a massive impact on me. Um, and I'm yeah. someone who always eats meat. I think it was a really well described um, documentary of the, of the diet or um, how yeah. athletes at the top are, are utilizing it. But it, as, as part of that documentary, you talk about your actual energy and iron increasing. Mm. Um, yeah, crazy. Does, does that translate to like better muscle performance either in speed or recovery or? 
iron? Yeah, just you just mean, across. Just general, yeah, or? just in general, more so for, for you. Yeah. Well, for me, it was more so recovery. Like I read a little bit about the dairy industry and what that can do um, to bone density and stuff. And even if you look at a lot of NFL, NFL players right now that have ditched dairy, are just like, holy sh. Like recovery is just insane. You know what I mean? Mm. And for me, I just try to tell people, well, you know, if you have to inject animals and, you know, dairy and their byproduct with certain chemicals just to be readily available, I mean, yeah, it's isn't that a bit weird in itself? Yeah. 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 So for me, it was just like my recovery was insane. I had more energy. My iron levels went up probably because I was actually eating more nutrient dense foods. You know what I mean? Right. Like we kind of just rely on meat for everything, but kind of also has that negative effect um but yeah my number one was definitely just recovery like through and through that's all i tell people it's just so nice to oh, like wake good. up and be able to get after it again so yeah i don't know if anyone's a meat eater like bagging me right now come on just give vegans a break with <laughs> <you>. <laughs> that's no, all i can say I think like, it, you just stay in my lane you stay in yours 100 <laughs> percent. i think it's pretty pretty cool because i mean um hearing people in within the documentary like be able to compete at the highest level on a vegan diet, yeah. people have always associated, oh, you need, you know, the, the meat protein and, you know, the, the fire that the red meat gives you, but obviously not because there's a lot of athletes yeah. out there like yourself that can com- can compete at the top level on a, on a different yeah. diet. Yeah, no, it can be done, for yeah. sure. And I think it's kind of funny, like, I remember in 2016, I would, if I had a bad race, people would immediately, like, blame the diet, but if I had a good one, it's just because I'm talented, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, it's a, like, it's fuck, a lo- you know? Lose, lose. <laughs> You know, <laughs> yeah. can't win either way. Yeah. Go on with your day. <laughs> so who is, I guess, can you give us some insight into who Morgan Mitchell is off the track? Like what, what keeps you interested and stimulated outside of, you know, running the 800 meter? Um, that's a good question. Probably, to be honest, I'm so relaxed and like low key about a lot of things, but I'm a bit of a nerd and all of my friends will tell you this. I'm happy with it, but like, I love to play piano. I'm still learning Spanish. I'm still in school. I'm enjoying that. I love hiking and online shopping and a little bit of design. So for me, it's just like, I reckon it's just undiagnosed ADD. I need to just be doing something all the time. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) But honestly, it's just like, I love nothing more than just like headphones in, going to a museum or just going shopping or doing stuff on my own because for me, like even going to the family farm, it's quite nice because there's hardly any internet i can just hang with my family sometimes we don't even talk to each other which is nice <laughs> and i can just be myself yeah um but then shit if you give me a taste of off season it's like don't call me for three days i'm partying <laughs> yeah 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 i've heard this right yeah <laughs> yeah yeah so that's probably me in a nutshell <laughs> do, do you do you find i mean you just by your description it seems like you've got good balance but do you feel you've got good balance from the sporting performance to just the being a, a day-to-day human being who can live you know, her own life. Yeah, definitely. I think I personally think I do because my coach now has given me so much more freedom. Um, obviously, yep. but I think I have it. I think I'm doing quite well because sometimes I put too much into athletics and forget my social life. Sometimes I'd obviously put too much into my social life and it'd show on the track. But now it's just like, I know exactly what I have to do to run well and one big 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 part of that for me is having fun you know sometimes i might have to jet off and do a shoot in sydney or whatever but i always tell my coach i'm either going to train that morning before the flight or straight after the shoot whether i'm dead to the world like training will get done um and that's the thing i think i wish people knew is you know you go to my instagram they're like she doesn't really upload too many sport videos she doesn't really I've, i've done it now but it's like I'm allowed to show what I want. I yeah. still have a life. Yeah. And even if I'm just showing you my life, trust me, I'm still training, but mm-hmm. I'm probably too heavily invested into training to actually upload anything at that time. So, uh-huh. yeah, I think I definitely have the balance done. Oh, like, that's good. Quite well. That's good. It's good you're mm-hmm. multi-skilled. So, you should, yeah, having different yeah. avenues to promote yourself and to grow your brand and have different yeah. business ventures is healthy. There's one thing for me when I, I like playing soccer, and you're probably, you mentioned it with Tokyo and there's probably some more events after Tokyo, but athlete transition is something I'm very passionate about because uh, like I yeah. like you, I was just in a world where I was known as Jake the soccer player and now you're Morgan the athlete and I had to completely disassociate mm. away from it when I came out of it because I was like the identity loss of not being in it anymore was really hard for me. Um, oh, wow. but, but do you do you have like, 
I guess, a view of, of what you want to do post athletics, like a, a bit of a path out, or is it kind of just, you know, you're just going to run and see what happens? <laughs> it's funny. Like, uh, it's, it, I tell you what's so interesting, and like, I don't want people to take this the wrong way or think I'm arrogant or anything, but I, I think it's because I have so much going on off the track. There are a lot of things I guess I could choose from. But for me, like my ultimate, ultimate goal is to just retire in Spain somewhere with an orange juice cart and sell orange juice for the rest of my life. <laughs> but between, I know, it's, I can see that happening. I'll, but, I'll join you. I'll have the sangria yeah. bus. <laughs> right. I'd be your number one customer. Yeah. Um, but no, I think between now and then, I'm really into design. So I'd like to get into some sort of area of fashion, whether it is designing or even just shadowing someone for a bit but recently like especially being in america and connecting with a few people in la i'd love to try something like acting or whatever just something super different oh yeah but i yeah I, it's a tough one because you know it's a big world and you can't just walk in and be the next bloody brad pitt that's great <laughs> one. yeah but yeah that's speak for, for me, yourself it's just something in that entertainment industry <laughs> <laughs> no that that's awesome yeah. that's awesome because you do a lot of, um, I mean, you do already a lot of kind of shoots and the entertainment industry. I mean, you're already kind of doing a lot of things proactively in that space. With Adidas, you're on the, the cover of Fitness First, a massive gym chain in Australia. Um, so I guess you're, you're kind of tapping into other areas outside of athletics, which is which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, let's just hope I can keep going with that, right, before I turn into a leather bag. <laughs> 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 no no it's it's awesome it's awesome i think it seems like you're a very well balanced person and it's exciting for you that with tokyo coming up i think um you know changing events you, you're gonna have an awesome time and um it's been been awesome having you on this podcast it's been uh, for the, for those that are tuning in we've had some wi-fi difficulties but the team at room 10 have done an awesome edit to make it uh all come through and uh, yeah, mate, what's your what's your plans now? Are you going to stay over there for, for the time being and train and prepare or have you got some meets coming up? Yeah, no, so I'm just training at the moment. Um, heading to LA for the birthday weekend in a hotel, which will be great. Beautiful. Um, and then probably just, yeah, and then just come home. I think I'll come home end of November because I do actually miss my squad and my coach and now that things are opening up, I'm like, okay, well, better kind of, you know, I've been training well over here, but... I love, love, love just being in Melbourne and, you know, running along mm. Melbourne Beach and at the track and the I best. just love familiarity. So, yeah, just to get back to that, I think that's one thing I'm missing right now. So that's probably next on my list is pay for that expensive flight back. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, it'll be good to have you back. We'll definitely, we'll definitely have to have a game of Uno where we can see the cards. Um, I'm pretty sure. Can I just quickly say you made the rules? <laughs> 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 anyone knows anyone knows me i am the biggest cheat when it comes to any form of like competitive game and uno i'll hang my hat on do not play with me but also do not play with morgan mitchell because she'll beat you at your own game <laughs> <laughs> Love that. No, though, as i said thanks thanks for coming on morgan we'll, we'll keep in touch and um you know super excited to see hopefully this documentary that comes out of the, the season leading into tokyo Thanks for having me. No worries. Pleasure.